Hey guys, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike. You guys rock with me on Mike's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we're going to be doing another Vsauce episode. This is, is your red the same as my red? Um, after this episode, we're going to be diving back into either my Muslim Conquest or my Napoleonic Wars uh, epi or series. And also guys, please, please, please don't forget to go check out my new uh, channel that I just uh, created. I posted it on this channel, but essentially it's called Don't Look Back. It's a, if you're into anything creepy, scary, anything like that, that's the channel for you. Please help support that channel. Uh, go subscribe, check out the content. Especially if you like anything 80s horror, it's a lot of synth wave on there, a lot of uh, 80, a lot of 80s horror overtones in anyway. Like I said, though, we're going to go ahead and get into this Vsauce reaction. Let's go ahead and get into it. Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. This appears blue. This appears yellow. And this appears green. Those of us with normal color vision can probably agree. But that doesn't change the fact that color is an illusion. Color as we know it does not exist in the outside world beyond us, like gravity or protons do. Instead, color is created inside our heads. Our brains convert a certain range of the electromagnetic spectrum into color. That kind of makes you think, like, because obviously he's right. Obviously, color comes from our from the light hitting our retinas and all that stuff. So, it kind of makes you think, like, what's the true color of the Earth? Is it like, you know what I'm saying? Is it just a lot of gray shades and stuff? But then again, even gray is a, even gray is a color. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of, it's kind of weird to think about. The electromagnetic spectrum into color. I can measure the wavelength of radiation, but I can't measure or observe the experience of a color inside your mind. So, how do I know that when you and me look at a strawberry and in my brain this perception occurs, which I call red, that in your brain a perception like this doesn't occur, which you have of course also learned to call red. We both call it red, we communicate effectively and walk away, never knowing just how different each of our internal experiences really were. Which is really crazy to think about, um, think about that, um, cause think about it, that you can't really explain, I guess, a color, I guess, if you think about it, like me explaining what's the color of this, uh, you know, this like little, uh, pumpkin thing, it's beige or brown, but what color is brown? You know what I'm saying? Um, I can say I'm brown, uh, the earth is brown, um, you know what I'm saying, like, but what is that to a blind person? It's nothing, you know what I'm saying? So it kind of seems impossible. It's kind of weird and eerie to think about, but I don't know. Her internal experiences really were. Of course, we already know that not everybody sees color in exactly the same way. One example would be color blindness. But we can diagnose and discuss these differences because people with the conditions fail to see things that most of us can. Conceivably though, there could be ways of seeing that we use that cause colors to look differently in different people's minds without altering their performance. Now, with that being said too, I know that there is a woman um, I know there's probably a few people, but it's like a, it's not a disease, it's like a, um, it's like a trait or something, but I don't think it's passed down either, it's just like, it's one of those rare things, where somebody's, um, I think it's called tetra, tetrachromacy or something like that, if you want to look it up, but essentially it's like, it, it allows somebody to see colors that not everybody else can see, so it allows somebody to see like hundreds, if not more thousands of more colors than, say, you or, or I can see. Which is kind of crazy to think about too, like how does that work for their brain, you know what I'm saying? How does that work for their eyesight, for their retinas, for all that, it's just all that. Different people's minds without altering their performances on any tests we could come up with. Of course, if that were the case, wouldn't some people think other colors looked better than others? Or that some colors were more complementary of others? Well, yeah, but doesn't that already happen? 
This matters because it shows how fundamentally, in terms of our perceptions, we are all alone in our minds. Let's say I met an alien from a far away solar system who, lucky enough, could speak English, but had never and could never feel pain. I could explain to the alien that pain is sent through A delta and C fibers to the spinal cord. The alien could learn every single cell and pathway and process and chemical involved in the feeling of pain. That could really go for any kind of sense if you think about it though really because I mean again me explaining to some think about it, me explaining to somebody who has no sense of touch anymore me explaining to them hey um you know this you know this feels really gritty or what does gritty feel like uh, rough was rough good. like you know what I'm saying it's just one of those things where it's like you would have to keep going down a, a almost deeper rabbit hole or to say of explain explanations because you just you have to explain what that next big thing feels like or is or whatever you know and pathway and process and chemical involved in the feeling of pain the alien could pass a biology exam about pain and believe that pain to us generally is a bad thing but no matter how much he learned, the alien would never actually feel pain. Philosophers call these ineffable, raw feelings qualia. And our inability to connect physical phenomenon to these raw feelings, our inability to explain and share our own internal quality. And that gap can really go for anything if you a lot of things, not really anything, but a lot of things, because somebody who has like lost their feeling in, you know, all their feelings, their taste, their touch, their sense of hearing, their sight, all that. Try to explain them so, you know, according, you know, you get to through that type of, um, you know, uh, communication gap. But try explaining that something like anything to that person, like how does, what does anything feel like? What does anything taste like? You don't. Anything that you described to them is it just another feeling, it's just another, you know what I'm saying? So it, yeah, I think that can go for a lot of different things, in my opinion, I don't know. Let me know, guys. And share our own internal qualia is known as the explanatory gap. This gap is confronted when describing color to someone who has been blind their entire life. Tommy Edison has never been able to see. He has a YouTube channel where he describes what being blind is like. It's an amazing channel. In one video, he talks about colors and how strange and foreign of a concept it seems to him. Sighted people try to explain, for instance, that red is hot and blue is cold. But to someone who has never seen a single color, that just seems weird and as he explains it has never caused him to finally see a color some philosophers like daniel dennett argue that qualia may be private and ineffable simply because of a failure of our own language not because well then that might just be a failure i think in all of human language period because i don't think there's any really language and you know let me know if i'm wrong because i know that there's plenty of languages that far exceed um the English language in terms of number of characters and all that stuff so I'm sure but you know I'm saying just I don't know if, if there is let me know guys but I, I don't I feel like there probably isn't one that adequately can explain what a, what what you know red looks like to a blind person if I'm if I'm wrong though let me know guys language not because they are necessarily always going to be impossible to share there may be an alien race that communicates in a language that causes colors to appear in your brain without your retina having to be involved at all, or without you having to have ever needed to actually see the color yourself. Perhaps even in English, he says, given millions and billions of words used in just the right way, it may be possible to adequately describe a color such that a blind person could see it for the first time. Or you could figure out that once and for all, yes, or no, in fact, you and your friend do not see the same red. But for now, it remains the case that we have no way. Yeah, and I don't think, I don't know if it'll ever be possible, because if you think about it, 
by what he's saying, you know what I'm saying, obviously color is just essentially something that happens in our brain. So essentially we're just seeing the same shades, really, you know, my, sh my shade of red is your same shade of red, you know, it could be technically my green, my pink, my blue, orange, whatever. But you know what I'm saying? Essentially, it's just a fact of that shade. Are we seeing that same shade? Does that make sense? I don't know. We have no way of knowing if my red is the same as your red. Maybe one day our language will allow us to share and find out. Or maybe it never will. I know it's frustrating to not have an answer, but the mere fact that you guys can ask me about my internal experiences, and the mere fact that I can ask my friends and we can all collectively wonder at the concept of qualia is quite incredible, and also quite... It's pretty surreal too, not having an answer, you know what I'm saying, but it's surreal that something as small as color can be so you know, impossible of a thing to master, if that makes sense. Like, obviously not master in, you know, these terms, but master in a language term, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's hard to master in those terms, which is crazy to think about, but yeah. Quite incredible, and also quite human. Animals can do all sorts of clever things that we do. They can use tools, problem solve, communicate, cooperate, exhibit curiosity, plan for the future. And although we can't know for sure, many animals certainly act as if they feel emotions, loneliness, fear. Yeah, and they can also freaking uh, form whole armies and stuff like in an uh, insect world. Those, that is insane with those uh, ants and stuff like that can do. It's like literally like whole sophisticated army, you see what I'm saying? Yes, fear, joy. Apes have even been taught to use language to talk to us humans. It's a sort of sign language that they've used to do everything from answer questions to express emotion or even produce novel thoughts. Unlike any other animal, these apes are able to understand language and form responses at about the level of a two and a half year old human child. But there's something that no signing ape has ever done. No ape has ever asked a question. Jo yeah, I think most of them just, I want to say most, this is, I think most animals, for the most part, just mainly just live in their own kind of existence, if that makes sense. But um, I, I know for, obviously they have curiosities and stuff like that, because say for existence, if for instance, if one gets mad or scared for uh, something, or you know what I'm saying, see something in the bushes, they're like, you know what I'm saying, obviously thinking to themselves, what is that? What just happened? Um, stuff like that. Or if, you know, you know, just stuff like that. But. A question. Joseph Jordania's Who Asked the First Question is a great read on this topic, and it's available for free online. For as long as we have been able to use sign language to communicate with apes, they have never wondered out loud about anything that we might know that they don't. Of course, this does not mean that apes and plenty of other animals aren't curious. They obviously are. But what it suggests is that they lack a theory of mind, an understanding that other people have separate minds, that they have knowledge, access to information that you might not have. Even us humans aren't... Well, I guess that kind of uh, separate is one of the many things that separates us from the animal kingdom, the wild, or whatever. It's just one of many intellectual things that separates our brain from animal brains, I guess you can say. Humans aren't born with a theory of mind. And there's a famous experiment to test when a human child first develops a theory of mind. It is called the Sally Ann test. During the test, researchers tell children a story about Sally and Ann. Sally and Ann have a box and a basket in their room. They also happen to have a delicious cookie. Now Sally takes the cookie and puts it inside the box. And then Sally leaves the room. While Sally is gone, Ann comes over to the box, takes the cookie out, and puts the cookie inside the basket. 
Now, when Sally comes back, the researchers ask the children, where will Sally look for the cookie? Obviously, Sally will look in the box. That's where she left it. She has no way of knowing what Anne did while she was gone. But until the age of about four, children will insist that Sally will check the basket, because after all, that's where the cookie is. The child saw Anne move the cookie, so why wouldn't Sally also know? And what's crazy too is that most kids can, obviously by the age of five or whatever, can tell this, but in most animals, their brains stop at a two to whatever, you know, level of thinking for a human, a two year old thinking for as a human, but a, a animal baby, a baby animal or whatever can also take care of itself. You know what I'm saying? Essentially almost right outside of the womb, whereas our babies have to take like freaking almost a decade to get to that point. But their minds is like a decade ahead, if that makes sense. I don't know. It's kind of crazy to think about. Saw Anne move the cookie, so why wouldn't Sally also know? Young children fail to realize that Sally's mental representation of the situation, her access to information, can be different than their own. And apes who know sign language but never ask us questions are doing the same thing. They're failing to recognize that other individuals have similar cognitive abilities and can be used as sources of information. So, we are all alone with our perceptions. We are alone in our own minds. We can both agree that chocolate tastes good, but I cannot climb into your consciousness and experience what chocolate tastes like to you. If anything, knowing how everything tastes, feels, essentially us having all of our senses and all that stuff, we should take it, not take it for granted, is what I'm getting from this, is because without those senses, essentially we would never know. And that's a really kind of creepy feeling if you think about it. It's what chocolate tastes like to you. I can never know if my red looks the same as your red, but I can ask. So stay human, stay curious, and let the entire world know that you are. And as always, thanks for watching. All right, guys, so that's it. Uh, we'll do it for this uh, episode. So, yeah, another DV sauce episode that make you freaking think and make your head hurt a little bit after, make you want to pop a couple of ibuprofen, but that's okay. With that being said, though, please, guys, don't forget to check out my other channel if you like scary, creepy, or anything type of that type of content. It's called Don't Don't Look Back. It's in the it's in my channel description or it's in my channel, which we call it. With that being said, I'll also link a uh, we should call it below just in case if you guys are curious with that being said i'll see you guys when i see you i'm out Peace.